Welcome to the Wednesday Match Play, your weekly connection to the biggest and best brands in golf. On this show you will learn more about the latest golf fashion trends, hear from LPGA and PGA Tour players, get advice on planning your next golf getaway and much more. Broadcasting live from Santa Rosa, California, please welcome your host, On The Tee, Ricky Potts. I had the pleasure of working with Jim Simpson for eight months at Tiburon Golf Club at the Ritz-Carlton Golf Resort in Naples. Jim and I became quick friends, and I always enjoyed seeing his smiling face around the club. Every time I saw Jim, he would shake my hand and truly go out of his way to ensure that our members and guests had an unforgettable experience day in and day out. He has a lot of experience in club management and brings his passion for overall member and guest satisfaction to everything he does. When I first met Jim, he was the group sales manager at Tiburon. Now he is the director of sales. This episode is a long time coming, and I'm honored to welcome Jim to the show. Let's get started. Jim, welcome to the Wednesday Match Play Podcast. Thank you, Ricky. I am both humbled and grateful to be part of your show. Thank you very much. Man, I got to tell you, it's, it's, it's been a fun transition. And, uh, you and I, just for the folks at home, worked together closely at Tiburon in Naples. We'll talk about that a little bit tonight, but uh, it's, just, it's great to hear you. You've been texting me back and forth the last few days, so I appreciate you remembering who I am and keeping me on your radar. It's hard to forget you, Ricky. So you've been in the golf business for a long time. Give me an overview of where it all began and the places that you have worked throughout your career. Uh, you know, I pretty much grew up in and around a golf course from probably the age of five. I would say at the age of 12, I pretty much knew what my uh, future would hold. I, I wanted to be a golf professional where I had my own property, and uh, I was fortunate enough to have great mentors at a, at a young young age. Pretty much left an indelible mark on me. It kind of fostered into where I am today. I have been fortunate enough, as I mentioned, to work under some some great leaders, uh, some of which who are in, uh, still in the industry. Some to mention would be uh, Gary Feldman. I was only 10 or 12 years old. He was a golf professional at a club there in uh, Lexington, Kentucky, where I was from. And uh, he just had a great way with people. He was very engaging. From that is where it uh, kind of started my path into where I wanted to be or what I wanted to be with a golf professional. And then from there, I kind of gravitated, uh, played a lot of junior golf. I was fortunate enough to have some skills. Uh, those skills have since left. I uh, started with Marriott Golf uh, and was with them for about 15 years. I uh, worked at Griffin Gate Resort in Lexington, Kentucky, which is my hometown. Uh, then uh, relocated to Marco Island, where I was fortunate enough to be on the opening team there at the time was the golf club at Marco, now the Rookery. From there, I went to Camelback in Arizona, Point Clear, Alabama. And uh, so 15 years of Marriott Golf was pretty much my university, my PGM training. From there, I worked at a private club here locally at Eagle Creek. And then uh, Mike Ryan, who is our COO of Trim Golf, asked me to open a property out in Ave Maria here in Collier County. Uh, we started that in 07. I worked 10 years there and uh, elevated to junior manager and then uh, back with Turn Golf recently as of August of this past year. So about 20 years in corporate management service, seven years in private industry, a couple of years in municipalities. So all in all, 30-year PGA history. It's uh, been a great story and I've enjoyed every minute of it. Well, man, you just named some names, Mike Ryan being one of them. I had the chance to work with him not as long as you did, but, man, he is just a also very big asset to both Troon and the game of golf. And the guy just is so humble. You've never met a nicer guy than Mike Ryan. And it's just it's nice to be able to, to, to pull those parallels. And, you know, I always like to say that the world of golf is so small. Tell me more about your position as the director of sales at Tiburon Golf Club in Naples, Florida. Well, when I came on board, uh, it was kind of, it, it opened up as a group sales manager position. Um, so it was kind of a liaison between Tiburon Golf Club uh, and the Ritz-Carlton Golf and Beach Resorts. So basically it was handling all the corporate events that come through both uh, resort facilities. Uh, and then was fortunate enough just 
really recently to be promoted to the director of golf sales there at Tiburon Golf Club, which basically is going to be still trying to see where that is going to be. Uh, the fact that I've been handling a lot of these groups, I've asked them just through the season uh, since I've touched many of them, email, phone calls, and they have my name. I wonder if it would be a disservice to just kind of turn them over to someone else. So that, that will kind of uh, conclude on or about June 1, and then we'll kind of identify the new role as to what direction we will take here at Tiburon in the director of sales position. In general, it would be just selling the golf club, selling the brand, which, you know, fortunate enough to its, its brand is pretty much well set. But as in any success, you've got to keep uh, the business coming in. So that'll be the primary role is to continue that and grow the business on down the line. So I'm looking very forward to it. It's new to me, having been in the golf side for many years, but the golf business is easy to sell. You're fortunate enough to, you know, 99% of the people that come through the door, it's just an easy, easy uh, transition to exceed their uh, expectations on a daily basis. So again, I'm looking forward to it. I would have to say, don't have them interrupt, but I, I, I met someone who, who uh, really kind of set the path of how to be an operator, and that's Clay Atchison, who is the vice president of Marriott Golf. Without him, I would not be here today, that's for sure. You do a great job of welcoming groups at Tiburon. I was so impressed with your just your energy that you have. How do you bring that to work every day? I mean, I could be walking in and you're welcoming in a group or I'm leaving for the day and you're just, just your energy is just so, so contagious. So where does that come from and how do you bring that to the job day in and day out? Well, I mean, like I said, Ricky, it's easy. I love doing what I do. I think that's critically important for anyone's success. Uh, you got to be happy in uh, what you do, and I'm fortunate to just love it. Uh, it's not hard for me. I like talking to people. I like engaging anyone uh, from across the planet for the most part. I've never met a stranger. And, it, and again, it's all about exceeding the expectation of both individuals and groups whether it be eight players or 144 players, I, I do my best to try to talk to each one of them. Uh, sometimes it's very difficult with the organized chaos that happens right before the tournament goes off. But uh, again, it's very easy for me because I love what I do. And, uh, you know, I enjoy uh, exceeding the experience of the customer and, and making sure that their day at any facility, most especially at Tiburon, is the ultimate golf experience. So let's say that I have a group of 20 guys. We're going to come play Tiburon. We're going to stay at the Ritz-Carlton. I want to have a three-day stay and play. What does that group process look like? If I contact you, do I contact the club? Do I go to the hotel? Kind of walk me through for the folks at home that want to come to Naples and have that stay and play experience. What's that process look like? Well, you know, it depends on how they reach out. Generally, uh, they will either come to me directly or start with the resort reservations department. If it turns out to be a stay and play, they will just, uh, they will obviously book the reservations and then the reservations agent will turn them over to the Ritz Golf Office uh, and the Troon team there to kind of accelerate their experience from, you know, the first point of contact. So, you know, we just do the basics. We send them an outing uh, event planner sheet so, you know, we can understand what their needs and wants are. Uh, generally, they just come to just enjoy themselves but if it's an organized format you know we get that all down on paper kind of give them some ideas to kind of maybe make that event even more special from the point of contact to delivery it's all about communication uh, staying in touch um, whether it be weekly or bi-weekly until they arrive you know like anything communications everything and, and they appreciate the emails i know we were discussing earlier about make you know answering emails late at night and as you know, I can answer them at any hour of the morning. But I'm, I'm you know, I think that's critically important to stay engaged in uh, in communication with your customer. It only just makes them feel feel more comfortable because ideally they're organizing it from many states away, and they're not on property. And that's our job. That's our job to make it easier for them and make them comfortable that when they get there and they arrive, that everything is on point, and, that, and that's what we do. The golf business is definitely not a nine to five business. So I can appreciate the fact that you respond at all hours of the night. 
Now, Tipperon Golf Club is located at the Ritz-Carlton Golf Resort in Naples. There's actually two Ritz-Carltons in Naples, Florida, the only city in the world that has multiple Ritz-Carlton towers. What percentage of groups stay and play at the resorts, or are the percentage higher for off-property, or do you even know that number? Are you tracking that number? Yeah, we do a great job. Uh, you know, as, you're only as good as the information you have, so we do a great job of tracking all that. The majority of the, the large business, even the smaller groups, you know, probably 85% of the group play that we have come in during season, November through April, is primarily beach uh, and golf resort related. Summer months, we kind of tap into the local market, uh, a lot of fundraisers, you know, uh, again, great revenue stream for the off months. But uh, again, majority of the business, 85, probably 85 to 90% is beach and golf resort related. Now, you like to play golf. I've seen you on the range hitting balls. What's your index? I mean, you're PGA, so it's got to be scratch. And I have to let you know, I'm still upset that we never got the chance to play. No, Rick, you know, after all the, the following you on Twitter and seeing your scorecards, I, I was almost uh, I was intimidated by your ridiculous skill set. So my index right now, if I was to have one, and yes, I am PGA, and no, I'm not scratch, so that is kind of a uh, misnomer in the industry. The the more you elevate with the PGA, unfortunately, at least in the operational side of the business, genuinely, unless you're at a private club and you're kind of paid to play golf, I don't play as much. But, you know, if I was guessing, that would be a solid 10, so I would need at least five aside from you. Now, wait a minute. You haven't seen me hit lately. I actually, I hadn't played in two weeks, played around. just I played like five holes. I think I lost five golf balls. Like, I mean, come on. PGA, you you know what's up. I think you're just laying down for your new folks. <laughs> that's possible too. <laughs> Tell yeah, me more about the time totally. that you spent at the University of Louisville. That's where you're from, and what what inspired you to go to that school, and what did you study, and kind of what was that experience like for you? Well, that's an interesting story. I actually, my father was a golf coach at Kentucky for about 14 years during my coming up as a junior. Obviously, uh, everybody's expectation that I was going to play at the University of Kentucky, and I had some outside scholarship availability, and unfortunately, I had a car accident my senior year and shattered my elbow, so that kind of, a lot of those uh, scholarship opportunities kind of dissipated, and I actually enrolled at the University of Kentucky the first semester, and, you know, I was still kind of disheveled and somewhat depressed, honestly, from the accident, and not kind of truly going where I would have liked to have gone uh, outside the state. So I left, uh, actually I left after one semester, went to work at uh, Marriott Golf at uh, Griffin Gate there. And then the spring, uh, a couple of golf pros and myself went to Louisville and played golf at a club called Standard Country Club. And I knew the golf coach there who had recruited me and he uh, saw me uh, there on the practice tee and kind of gave me a what to and therefore about leaving the university and basically told me if I could shoot 75 or better that day, he'd offer me a scholarship. And I was fortunate enough to shoot that. And the next day I had an overnight package of a full scholarship to the University of Louisville. Uh, I spent three years there. I studied psychology, uh, kind of going back from when I, in the first introductory part. Uh, you know, I knew what I wanted to do. I wanted to be a PGA professional. So I thought uh, another year of school, I actually left school early uh, and just kind of played the local local circuit as a pro and realized, uh, you know, it's, it's, just, it's kind of like the NBA. You got 10,000 kids that can play and only about a couple of hundred make it. So I knew, again, deep down, I wanted to be a PGA pro. So I immediately entered the PG, PGA uh, business school program. Uh, far different than where it is today, but uh, I earned my membership in 1989. So I was only 25 years old. I was a full member of the PGA, and it's been a it's been a blessing ever since. So it was a great time at Louisville. I probably should have spent more time studying and less on the range. But again, I, I knew just deep down inside where I needed to be. And like I said, it's the 15 years with Marriott was probably. Uh, four years of college and four years of graduate school. And I felt when I came out of uh, Marriott Golf that uh, I was had an MBA and PGA and then I was ready to take on the world. Now, you mentioned Marriott Golf, but I haven't heard you talk about Hampton Golf. You spent four years at Hampton Golf. 
tell me more about that company and what did you do while you were with that company? So when, uh, when, uh, Hampton golf came on board at Panther run, I had two kids in high school, one in elementary, and then true golf was there at the time. And, um, uh, and I probably had the opportunity to leave and, and, and relocate with Troom, but you know, my kids are very important to me. So I didn't want to have them, uh, uprooted from the school systems, you know, which are excellent here. So I stayed on board and Hampton Goss is just, is a, is a great company uh, led by MG Orender, past PGA president. Uh, he is fully engaged to his, his business. He basically, he would show up unannounced, but, Never kind of a, a micromanager. He let the players do their job and, you know, obviously held people accountable. But uh, it was a great, great run with Hampton Golf, and they, they run a very classy operation. And, uh, you know, it's a smaller operation, but it's very family-oriented. I mean, the corporate operations is just a, a great vibe in the office. You know, everybody, and I still talk to many of them, many of them on social media to this day. I uh, made had great relationships with him, but I can't say enough about Hampton Golf and M.G. Orender as their leader. He is just a solid, solid, solid man. Tell me more about your time with the first tee. So when I was at Panther Run, uh, Cindy Darlin was uh, who's pretty much been in, a part of the first tee since its inception. They were running a uh, kind of a pseudo first tee. They were actually just starting it off in Immokalee. And so we were obviously in close proximity. Uh, and again, it was just the love for the game. Uh, kind of that was the, kind of the birth of the growing the game initiative with the PGA. And so it's easy, you know, with kids. Uh, I was fortunate enough to coach all of my kids and just recreational sports and just uh, seeing their eyes light up when they hit that first good shot, regardless if that's the only shot they hit, uh, it was an easy transition for me. But again, it's just uh, the first tee is just an excellent program. I mean, it's grown leaps and bounds, especially in Collier County. We host them at Tiburon. Uh, actually, we've got a fundraiser coming up here very shortly for the first tee of Collier County. And uh, Cindy Darling is still uh, a big part of that. And, and you know, you're only as good as those you surround yourself with. And certainly she's led the charge of the first tee for Collier County. I had the chance to spend some time with her and Derek, and they just get it. And I, that's really cool that, that you have that history with them. And as you mentioned, they do spend a lot of time at Tiburon, and there's nothing cooler than to walk out at 4 or 5 o'clock on a, on a Monday night and to see 25, 30 kids on the putting green just learning the game and the effort that they put in for an organization like that. And that's, that's our future. And that's the exciting thing is that, you know, I hear a lot of talk that golf is in the decline and golf is dwindling. Prove it because in our world, it's only growing and it's only getting better. And the first tee is a big part of that. No, oh, absolutely. I agree. And the, the best part about the first tee out at, uh, at our place at Panther Run at the time was, again, uh, getting the kids uh, in a mockery to engage the game of golf great people and you know wouldn't normally have access to golf but it has grown considerably uh matter of fact a young man who was a part of that program recently will be graduating from the fgcu pgm program and uh gerardo and we still stay in touch on social media and uh he is just a fine young man and a fine example of what that program meant to uh both he and and others and out of a mockery and uh again just a just an incredible program great initiative to grow the game and and you know it's a fun atmosphere it's just not it's not a rigid you know lesson instruction it it basically is, teaches the skills of life which uh moving forward is going to be critical for our new generation i know they catch a lot of slack uh for being this new generation but uh you know the success is, is all in their hands and i'm very confident that uh might not be the way we kind of grew up with it of course you're still a young man but uh i think uh i think we've got a, a great sense of young people coming up and i'm sure they'll carry the stripes red white and blue stripes very well in the future i have a lot of gray hair that will dispute that comment that i'm a young man 
That's only in the last two weeks, actually. <laughs> you can say that again. What's the most recent book that you have read? Oh, goodness gracious. Uh, I read that it's probably been a while. Uh, I'm actually, I'm a big Game of Thrones fan, oddly enough, at uh, my senior age. But uh, I'm th- I was actually considering uh, starting that uh, series of books. But I think the, probably the most recent would be The uh, Greatest Golfer Who Never Lived. It's a fictional story. Uh, just a, a short read, but just a great story by J. Michael Barron. In a nutshell, it's just about an intern who started at a law firm. He came across an old case file of a murder mystery at a country club and uh, he kind of followed it in his relationship to Bobby Jones uh, and this golfer who was just literally beat everybody, everybody that was anybody at that time uh, and just never, never had the uh, accolades because he was, uh, not to give it away, he was kind of wanted. (laughs) <laughs> but a great story, great read, quick read, but uh, I would recommend it. Very good book. You know me, I love a good story, and I actually just made a note to download that book because I want to read it. That I, I've never heard of that, and anything golf-related, regardless of what the story is, I'm interested. So I appreciate that, that uh, recommendation, and I'll let you know how it is after I finish it. Many years when I was out at Camelback, uh, Great Hawk Golf Club used to give that book away at the end of 18. You'd finish 18, and at, at the end, there'd be that book that was there, and they'd give that to every golfer that came through. And I remember having the book. I never read it, and then just kind of one day just was on Kindle and saw it, and I said, you know what? I'm going to give that a shot. And then it was a quick read. It's not, you know, nothing – Nothing time consuming, but I never put it down. I finished it, and it was uh, again great story. You'll you'll like it. You'll you'll enjoy. It. You'll probably knock it out in about twenty minutes. Right? Do groups prefer the gold course or the black course? And I'm not even sure you've played both of them. But which do you prefer? <laughs> Honestly, I, I have played. I've been, I've played both of them. Uh, not as much as I would like. Uh, but to answer your first question, most of the groups obviously want to play the go course where, you know, we host the CME LPGA Tour Championship and the QB, QBE PGA Tour Shootout hosted by Greg Norman. Because of its popularity and recognition, most groups request that. But if you're asking me, uh, I, I prefer the black. Uh, it's, it's a shorter golf course, but it requires a lot of shot making off the tee. Um, but both courses are outstanding. I mean, it's just, again, a great golf experience. Uh, two different golf courses, but uh, if you're fortunate enough to be here over a couple, three days, you'll, you'll get the pleasure of playing both as we alternate uh, daily between resort access and member access for each facility. But uh, Gold Course, probably the most popular. Uh, and then my favorite would probably be the Black Course. I'm with you. It requires so much more strategy off the tee, and it doesn't feel like you're in Florida, quite frankly. It feels like, I mean, I don't even know where it feels like, but you just, very tight fairways, very, I mean, I would hit driver two, three, maybe four times in a round, and just a a really good challenge of golf. It's harder than the gold course, even though it's two, three, four hundred yards shorter. So it's interesting to, to hear to the folks that have played both, which they prefer. Yeah, there's a couple of holes you got to walk single file down the fairway. And they're par fives, too. Now, you do a great job sharing content on social media. You've mentioned social media a couple of times in this conversation. What networks are you most active on, and what are some of the networks that you are aware of that you don't use, and why not? I mean, you're good on Twitter. You're good on LinkedIn. Like, what's your what's your strategy look like when it comes to social media? I was kind of a pseudo-social media guy coming to Tiburon, and then I met you, Ricky Lee. And uh, it was amazing, uh, the content that you produced. And uh, just and so I kind of, kind of picked up the pace a little bit to keep up with you. Uh, I learned a great deal from you, and I'm grateful for that. I always will be. But Twitter, LinkedIn is probably my most popular as I try to promote uh, Tiburon as best I can. A uh, big fan of agronomics. Uh, I think we have just a ridiculous maintenance staff led by Jeff Cathy. Uh, Brian Woods on the gold and uh, Ryan Sherbert on the black course, but probably LinkedIn, Twitter, uh, Instagram, um, 
uh, that's pretty much my three. I, I don't really know much more than that. I'm not, I'm not considering myself a techie, but again, just promoting the facility. Um, I mean, obviously that's, that's the way to go with social media. It drives a lot of, uh, a lot of great hits and, uh, People recognize it, especially for this generation and generations of my time. Those are my main three. I stick to them. They've been uh, very comfortable with. But if you envy others, uh, you left too soon. I couldn't uh, couldn't learn anymore from you. Well, because we have social media, we can still connect. I mean, it's not like I'm well, that's true. not accessible. No, that's true. I'll still text you every morning. Love it. Who is in your dream foursome? Oh, my father, of course. Uh, uh, he kind of obviously led me into the game of golf. Uh, Jack Nicklaus, uh, probably Bobby Jones, and uh, my favorite, Ben Hogan. Talking about the greatest golfers of all time, I'm a big Tiger fan. Do you think he really? breaks Jack's record? Why or why not really? Yeah, you know. You know, that's, I'd honestly, as much as I would l- I would like to see him too. I, I would love to see him do it I, at his age, uh, physical limit, and just with the incredible amount of talent around him. I don't see it. Will he get close? I think so, but that's uh, that's a big hurdle he has in front of him, and, and I know he would obviously, I think he's just looking for that next one. But uh, I wouldn't put it past him, but if I was a betting man, I would probably have to go against it. As much as I know that hurts, hurts to hear you or hear me say that uh i'm a huge tiger fan don't get me wrong i think he is just a absolute classic for the game just it's just a tall water at his age and with the talent level of talent around him and just the changing of the game itself and his limitations physically but again it wouldn't surprise me if he did Chip Essig from the PGA. I'm not sure you know who he is he's a good friend of mine he was on the show i mean it's been years ago now and I asked him the exact same question, and he said that if Tiger wins one more, that he breaks the record. And I loved that because that would be the motivation that he has. To, one, we, he's proven he can win again, but now that he can prove that he can go win majors again, it would be enough for him to get motivation to go out and win two, three, four, five more major championships. I feel like he's, yes, he's, he's in his early 40s. His body is, as we all know, breaking down. His neck, I mean, where'd that come from? I think there's something more to that. He's just <laughs> tired. He's prepping for Augusta here in a few weeks. But what I think that the best thing about him and his kind of comeback is now he's starting to play on his schedule. He's not worried about playing in every tournament every week. He's trying to play the right tournaments, trying to prep for the major championships. He's 43 now, but he could win at Augusta. He could win at Pebble. He could win anywhere in Scotland until he's in his early to mid-50s. Because you look at guys that are starting to get to their early to mid-50s, the one major championships, were never is a fraction of the physical shape that he's currently in. He's still hitting the ball 300-plus yards off the tee. He's working out all a bit, not as much as he used to. But I feel like if he gets a couple – He's going to be off to the races, and that record's going to be a, a lot closer to possible if he can just get one more. And I don't want him to get to where he wins two or three more, where he gets even closer and he teases it. And he definitely can't tie it. If he ties it, he's got to break it, or I don't want him to tie it. Because if he ties it... <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, I, I agree with everything you said there. It's, it's a tall order. It, again, it wouldn't surprise me. But uh, a lot of talent around him, a lot of talent coming up. But yeah, he and if he does, I mean, it's highly possible if he gets that first one, Augusta, whichever it is. I think winning last year uh, at the Tour Championship was just amazing. That last eight, that 18th hole was just uh, incredible to watch on TV, and something I'll never forget. Uh, it, it brought back memories of old of Palmer and Nicholas, and no crowd control, and it was. Uh, I think it was great for the game. Obviously, great for Tiger. But uh, yeah, it gave him a little little taste of where he used to be and the sky's the limit still with him i agree but uh, tall order to reach that number of uh, jack when he won the tour championship i wasn't crying you were crying i'm just saying i'm not crying, crying. <laughs> what what's next for jim simpson i mean you're just getting kind of dialed in there at tiburon you've got the new promotion the director <laughs> of sales what's the immediate future look like for you and, and the club there in naples 
Well, it's just uh, embracing the new position and doing uh, everything I can alongside our team, uh, which we have just an extraordinary group of uh, professionals from the front of the house to the back of the house. I think we have one of the best service areas, Shark Alley. Um, our, our warriors of hospitality, our men and women in blue, they are just they go above and beyond service, get comments every day. But now just put, you know, pushing the needle and learning the new position, uh, doing whatever I can to continuously deliver and exceed the ultimate golf experience at Tiburon Golf Club, grow the local sales base and try to get some local groups in there not only during the summer, but in season, it's not just selling golf. It's, it's selling the, the entire property, meeting space, banquet space, anything we can do to continue to, to just uh, elevate the brand at Tiburon and uh, obviously Troon, uh, one of the best companies that uh, I've been fortunate enough to work for three great companies. And my love is with Troon and uh, the sky's the limit. I may be 53 or 54 years old, but uh, I feel like I'm 25. Uh, I try to lead by example and I work hard and at every discipline within the property. I want to give an extra hand to anybody. So, and that kind of just creates an atmosphere of, uh, uh, servant leadership. And that's kind of what the, the way I follow it, you know, you'd be have empathy for others and not every story is the right story, but, uh, can always be a better story if, uh, if you're working hard to achieve it. Couldn't have said it better myself. There's a reason why you and I have connected and there's a reason why you and I have remained friends and I'm honored to have had the chance to work with you. And I got to tell you every day when I wake up and I got a Ricky Lee text on my phone, it just makes my day. So you keep doing that and you're going to, you're going to go a long way with me, my man. Ricky Lee, when I actually hit that, when I literally start typing that text, it puts a smile on my face. Cause I know it's going to put a smile on your face and that's, that's the whole reason behind it. And obviously, uh, uh, I thank the world of you. I wish you the best uh, at your new facility there. And Santa Rosa uh, will never be the same. In golf, the 19th hole is a slang term for a bar or a restaurant on or near the golf course, very often in the clubhouse itself. There are, as you and I both know, a lot of great places to have a drink in Naples. Now, I think I know how you're going to answer this, but what is your favorite 19th hole and what are you drinking? Well, my, obviously my favorite 19th hole is Bo Campers, which is located right across the street. Uh, a few of us gather mostly on Fridays. Uh, we call it the debriefing session for the week. Uh, dollar drafts. Uh, I'm a Miller Lite guy. I'm not really a connoisseur of a lot of things. Bourbon-wise, I'm anything Kentucky, Kentucky made. Uh, Jim Beam would be my choice, what to reserve. Again, anything, any, any Kentucky bourbon, I'd be happy to sip on. But I'm, I'm pretty much just a boring Miller Lite guy. Jam, thank you again for coming on the show. This has been fantastic. I really enjoyed learning more about you and your past and your career. I miss your positive attitude. I mean, my goodness, we've talked about it, and, and you've, you've hit it on the head several times in this conversation. And I sure miss more than anything. You coming into my office screaming, Ricky Lee. I mean, the text message is definitely, it literally makes my day every time I see that. So for those of you listening at home, I, I did steal this from Corey Schaub, a PGA professional, also at Tiburon Golf Club. But when Jim would come in and say that, or he even when he texts me that, he comes in, he says, Ricky Lee, what do I say? What's shaking? That puts this installment of the Wednesday Match Play podcast in the books. But we'll be back next week for another exciting episode of the show.